You're listening to Spotlight, the podcast that fosters connections with veterans and military spouses. Here's your host, Bob Lowden. Welcome, everybody. This is your host, Bob Lowden, and welcome to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. Very pleased today to have as our guest, James Patrick. He is a risk products executive with SWBC in San Antonio, Texas. He is also the chairman of the board of SoundOff, a uh, veteran service organization focused on veteran suicide. James, welcome to the Spotlight. Thanks for stepping into it. Thanks very much for having me, Bob. I really appreciate you bringing me on, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. I uh, would love to start out. Uh, you know, I understand from conversation with you, you went to college, uh, Cornell, and uh, on an Army scholarship. Uh, that's a probably a pretty narrow pathway, but uh, <laughs> interested to hear how that turned out. Have you always wanted to go into the Army? I, ironically, no. I, I had. Um, some inspiration from my uncle and my, my grandfather who are both in the army. Um, I think in high school, uh, I was looking at my brother who was six years older, who had done Navy ROTC and it just made sense to me to, you know, Cornell's an expensive college to, to help pay for school and sort of have a guaranteed job after, after active service or after graduating. So um, in, in retrospect, uh, I had about a nine year career and uh, I would not have changed anything for a minute. I'd, Really love the time that I had in the army. That's fantastic. So, um, uh, tell us a little bit about going into the army uh, and becoming a special forces officer. Uh, was that a longer term plan, or how did that come about? <laughs> uh, that's actually a funny story too. Um, I was an armor officer initially, stationed in in Korea, and had some some challenging uh, commanders. Again, I think we talk about leadership often in in veteran and military circles, and you learn just as much from from uh, strong or, or quality leaders as you do from from poor leaders. And I was contemplating a departure from from the army right after my obligation. And I was restationed back at Fort Hood in Texas. And the headquarters commander for the first cab division, um, major at the time, Steve Warren, eventually became a um, PAO officer and spokes, spokesman for for the Pentagon. He said, you know, James, give, give the Army a second chance. Go command something, and, and um, you'll find that it'll be uh, much more rewarding than, than the time that, that you've had. So I, I, I heeded his, his advice and went through uh, selection, and it was in training where I really learned uh, how unique and incredibly, uh, not to reuse the term, but special – um, an ODA is and, and, and the, the mission that they have to sort of go into us, your environments, you know, often underfunded and just ask to affect national security policy. So um, it was, it was a, a very incredible time for me. I loved it. So uh, I'm, I'm curious if you uh, ever crossed paths with Congressman Mike Waltz. Uh, <laughs> did you know him? I, I, I met Mike after my my time on active service. <clears throat> I was living in D.C. and I had started a, a software company with with a few uh, folks that I served with, uh, third group uh, team leaders, and uh, doing some business development in, in D.C. And, and ran across Mike and he introduced me to one of his uh, colleagues, France Hong, who's also uh, oh, in, in the National Guard out of, of Maryland. So. Yeah, he, uh, got, he got France back into the army. France had gotten out, and and boy, what a what a recruiter! <laughs> yeah, 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 he is, uh, and I'm I'm very happy to see Mike doing well in Florida, and and you know, making another big difference uh, at the national level. France has gotten out of the D.C. area and moved to Colorado Springs. Uh, I don't know if you knew that, but. Uh, Another good dude that uh, he's actually been on on the program. Okay, so uh, you you get into the uh, special forces. Talk a little bit about some of the uh, I don't know the active duty and your experiences there and what you drew from that because then you go on to sort of launch an entrepreneurial career. But uh, I, I, you know my experience is the guys that with special forces experience make pretty good entrepreneurs. So we've learned we we learn a lot of lessons in the military. I think I think a big part and and 
other veterans uh, who happen to have served in special forces say the same thing. You, you, you just sort of learn that you figure it out. You, you have to survive. And, and I've said this before, uh, running a, my own company was probably the most stressful event I've ever come across more so than being in, in combat. And, and it's, it's this focus on the mission. It's understanding uh, failure is not an option and just the drive that you have a, as an individual that really pushes you forward. And I think a big part of it too is understanding what motivates you, uh, why you do what you do every day. I think that's a, a big part, not just in, in running a company or serving in the special operations uh, or any military capacity, but it's also uh, when you transition from one chapter of your life to, to, to the next. So going back to my, my active service, you know, my, my time was in Iraq, uh, 2006, 2007, yes. uh, training the um, Iraqi Special Operations Forces. And then in 2008, uh, changed the missions a little bit. <clears throat> we had uh, gone to, my, my unit had backfilled the, uh, it was called the Commanders in Extremist Force, the SIF, and Germany had deployed to Iraq. So my company had gone to backfill in, in Germany. And from there, I went down to Republic of Georgia on a training mission. And at the time, Georgia was trying to join NATO and as a gesture, wanted to send its troops to Afghanistan. Georgians were already in Iraq, but as a as a as uh, another uh, gesture, wanted to send them to Afghanistan. So we were training them for, you know, basic infantry tactics, uh, marksmanship, mounted maneuvering, patrolling in, in through villages. And it was during that time when uh, Russia actually invaded the semi-autonomous regions, which is something you've seen more recently with the Ukraine. So um, that was an, another uh, really interesting, um, exciting time for us. Uh, as, as a person who spent my time in the service during the Cold War, uh, I like those guys very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it was it was interesting You're, because oh, my secret's safe with you. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. We we were um, we were basically running missions to be eyes and ears for the defense attaché, and during one of those maneuvers, we we worked with um, the, the chief of station and and some of his personnel on the ground and. The Russians had had moved as far east as they were going to and had, had started establishing uh, flash checkpoints. And the gentleman we were with had called the chief of station who said, hey, time to come back to, to base now to, to capital Tbilisi. We were in a, another town. And as you're going through these checkpoints, you know, you don't think about Russia hasn't fought in a war in you know years and they had Going through this checkpoint, it was a, a armored personnel carrier. You had troops on top, their hair, their helmets off and to the side, and just, they looked very disheveled as 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 troops. And you know, you, it was actually kind of scary because you know you weren't sure how they react to you in civilian clothes walk driving through a checkpoint. So, um, sort of two points there: sort of a hairy hairy experience for us, but also uh, just a a, a commentary on the state of the Russian fighting force. Mm. Anecdotally, yeah. So um, you get out of the service and start sort of an entrepreneurial career. Tell us a little bit about. Uh, I'd like to hear about Decision Grid, a business that you uh, started. It was a it was a long journey. The end goal was basically quantifying terrorism risk, and if you think about most risky behavior or antisocial behavior or driving a car, you can look at the last 1,000 or last 10 years, the last 1,000 events or last 10 years of behavior to predict and model uh, future um, future behavior. Again, your age and, and your demographic demography sort of dictates how, how you'll drive. And so insurance company use that modeling, you know, very specifically, but when it comes to terrorism or terrorist acts, there's not going to be another 9-11, right? It's hard to take the last 1,000 events to sort of predict what's going to happen in the future. 
the frequency changes as is the severity. How, what is what is what is uh, attacked or the scale of the attack is sort of unknown. So we had developed a, a methodology, um, my friends Dave Staffel and Ben Collins and I, that sort of looked at an asset, take a liquid natural gas plant um, in the context of its, of its environment as a way to predict the types of attack that could happen and the potential cost and, and, and um, damage that could happen. So the journey was to, it was a methodology when we first launched the business and we had taken that methodology to Lloyd's of London and pitched their syndicate uh, group. And the team said, that's fantastic, love it, but this needs to be done in six minutes, not six days. We need this, it needs to be a software, right? And so we embarked on this journey where we developed a data visualization tool to enable us to gather more data to help us refine the model to then have a full uh, system that a insurance or any multinational corporation could use to then uh, look at and quantify and potentially underwrite terrorism risk. So this so is that sort of an the, actuarial model approach, not a, a real-time uh, defense mechanism? Exactly, exactly. This is exactly correct, yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, you spent a little time at USAA, and now you're at SWBC, Risk Products Executive. I guess you're kind of, have you sort of stayed in that same uh, stovepipe in terms of the actuarial and risk uh, business professionally? Uh, moving more, moving more towards uh, user or customer facing technologies that manage or mitigate risk, and and it, at USAA it was a, I ran a team that uh, managed the full life cycle of the customer in the insurance business. So new customers coming to enroll and and purchase uh, a policy, if you will, uh, the, the product is the policy. Uh, coming in to seek your uh, identification card, hey, I need to show proof of insurance, so that experience all on, on digital channels, on your app, on mobile browser, on, on your account online, and then submitting claims. Uh, and so just continuing to, to build upon the experiences that I've had in the past with entrepreneurship and then in, in corporate America. But what's in retrospect, now that I look back at my uh, I, I left Decision Grid probably around 2014, 15. So the last, you know, six years almost. You miss that that the drive, the the it's it's kind of like what you had an active service prepping for a mission ready to go out. Same with with entrepreneurship. There's just this passion and excitement that happens when you're selling or you're creating your own. Uh, your own product or service. And, and so I've, I've had to find other ways of sort of itching that, scratching that itch and in, in, in sound off is one of those ways, working with groups like Bunker Labs, a national you know, uh, entrepreneur group for, for veterans, just helping others around me because ideas are a dime a dozen. When it comes to launching a new venture or a new business, it comes down to execution. How good are you at, at understanding the, 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 the problem of the market and delivering the solution to the market, right? And that's not an easy task. And so for me, while I'm, I, I have the day job of corporate America, I, I find myself you know, burning the calendar, ca candle on both ends to help uh, myself and help others uh, think about and, and launch other ventures. So let's, all right, I'm going to drill down on your passions here then. So we'll go down the entrepreneurial mm -hmm. trail here for a second. Bunker Labs, uh, what kind of things have you been doing with Bunker? They I was a, over at- a pretty uh, big operation there in San Antonio. Oh, they do. And, and, and Jonathan and Sabrina are, are friends of mine. I've, I've just I have attended their meetings, uh, have, have linked up with other entrepreneurs. Um, I went to their national summit last year. Um, and it's just incredible what Todd Connor has done mm -hmm. over the last several years. And I remember talking to him probably about five years ago when I was at USAA. And he was it was early on and he was fundraising, um, getting some some seed capital for for the event for the organization. 
And his passion for, for others, his drive to um, empower and enable others is just, it's infectious. And I, I love being in the room with him, you know, and that's, that's, I think a sign of a, of a, of a, in, a well-tested CEO, right? So somebody who just is infectious in, in, in how they are and how they act. And Todd is a great example of that. Uh, you know, Todd Connor, um, uh, Navy veteran, CEO of Bunker Labs, had him on the program. This is how good of an interviewer I am, James. I got this little tidbit. You know, one interesting thing about Todd that you might not have known is that when he was at Northwestern, he was the mascot. So evidently, he's got some good <laughs> dance moves. <laughs> dance moves and enthusiasm. The next time you see him, that. you not can say, all. I heard that you were, I don't know, some, <laughs> some kind of a cat, you know, that they had at Northwest. I forget the name of it right now, but you'll have to ask him about his days as the Northwestern mascot. <laughs> that reminds me of a book by Peter Thiel. Uh, Zero to One is is the name of the book. And it it's it's a uh, written form of a, of a class he teaches at Stanford. And, and one of the pieces you know, one of the chapters talks about the the CEO of, of a startup and, and just the quirkiness that he or she exhibits and I think like I said if Todd was a mascot at Northwestern that that explains a lot I think we should you know we should issue a challenge for him to put the mascot outfit back on and you know show us the break dancing moves or whatever it was he used to do see if he still got it what do you think we'll do a shout out to todd uh in in that regards so uh, I, love I, it. I love entrepreneurship do you do you uh think have you got some tips uh for folks you know about becoming an entrepreneur i mean uh Yes, yeah, there's so many things that can go wrong <laughs> when you start a business. You don't even know what you're getting yourself into. But uh, you know what? What sort of the takeaways for you? Uh, what What are the bruises, cuts, and scars you've got from that episode? Uh, there, there's there's many, and, and there's lots of advice that I can I can touch upon. I think a a big part of it is make sure that you're solving a market problem. And then your own venture or a product line within within a um, within a company. I, I had a a business school professor. His name is Rob Adams. He wrote a book. Um, if you build it, will they come? And it's it's basically a process to follow to ensure that you are not wasting a lot of time and money. Again, there's a lot of pitfalls along the way, but just starting off to 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 go about this low cost process of validating that there is the pain point that you're solving. I think that's a big part of it. Just will people pay, reach into the park pocket, pull out money and pay for whatever it is you're bringing to the market. Um, I think the second one is, is understanding your strengths and weaknesses or, or opportunities as a, uh, as an individual and as a business minded person and, and, working and surrounding yourself with others um, who maybe have different capabilities. And that's just an obvious sort of team building, um, foundational team building uh, effort. And be, don't be embarrassed that you're starting out. I think I've run across a number of entrepreneurs who say, well, I only have one customer. I only have you know, five people using the, the application. That's okay, you have to start somewhere. Um, be, don't ever second guess the the effort that you're embarking on and, and why you're doing it and and the drive that you have to have. I think that's a, a big um, a big piece as well. And I think I, I I think about this for myself and on why. And I said it before, but why do you why do you do certain things? What is your motivation? And I think having that north star either in your personal life in your uh, professional life in transition from one chapter to another in your life, that's critical. Understand why you do certain things, have that motivation and that, and that uh, understanding of who you are. It, it, boy, now, now you've opened up Pandora's box because I got all kinds of things to ask you. But one, one of the things Francois sure. uh, preaches is that, you know, being a, being an entrepreneur is, you know, don't, don't go into it if the only reason you're doing it is to make money, right? Because so many of them, 
don't, right? But if if it w- would you do it, even if you weren't getting paid to do it, you know, is it that, you know, does it, you know, is it that worthwhile? Is is one thing. The second thing that France preaches is that, you know, in any business, it's probably one percent idea, forty nine percent people and 50% execution, right? You, t- you touched yeah. on the people side. What have you learned on the execution side, uh, you know, that 50% of being a successful entrepreneur that you might share? You know, I, I had this somewhat short-sighted view on, on life when I left college. I said, okay, my, my learning is done, right? <laughs> I said, I've got my degree. I've got the, the, the piece of paper on the wall and that's all I need to worry about. And when it comes to the execution, I think that there are just some fundamental um, business books or classes that that any entrepreneur should kind of touch upon. Accounting, you know, finance uh, being another, just uh, strategy being a, a, another, a third. Just understanding how uh, how businesses run. You know, I I didn't go to business school until just a couple of years ago, and I I look at what I learned and, and I say to myself, wow, I really wish I could have done that early on. I, again, wouldn't have changed the path because I think you, you, if you're in survival mode, you, 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 you know, you're forced to learn things. Um, so I, I think just, you know, there's a tremendous uh, amount of resources out there on, you know, how to put a business plan together, how to think about the financials, how to, understand uh, accounting how to budget your your future and i think that those are um learning how to do those will will benefit you greatly in in the long term you know when you go back to business school is a great question you sort of touched on that you know i I think it's great to go to business school and have the experiences that you had you're you're bringing so much to it and your perspective candidly the way you would have solved problems uh when you went versus if you'd gone earlier, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a great question right there. All right. All right so back, back down in, in, into passions, because I want to get to uh, sound off, but you also do a lot of stuff with folks that are transitioning, not necessarily just transitioning out of the military into business, but even transitioning in midlife careers. And as a person that had a midlife crisis of my own, I mean, I did a real left turn uh, career wise 25 years ago. Um, you know, let's talk about your passion there. You like to do a sure. lot of stuff. Uh, I have a, uh... I, I've used this as an example because it, it's so it's so funny. When I was interviewing for USAA, a friend of mine, uh, I was basically re- interviewing for a, a job that uh, he was leaving, and I was going to backfill him. And he was an, an Army veteran, and I I had never interviewed before. You think about your career in the military; you never have to interview. And I had no idea. I was so stiff, so formal. I was waiting for the interviewer to ask me questions and, and I was basically mouth breathing the entire time. And my, the, the hiring manager asked my friends, is, is, is he okay? Like, should I even consider this individual? And, and, and he said, give him a second chance. And, and, I, and I tell that story because I have since learned really how to interview well and, and how to be unafraid to tell my story, to take not control of the, of, of the interview, but just be a bold in, in talking about who I am and uh, being less humble and, and, and talking about it. And it, when it comes to transitioning, I think that it's the people around you, the network, the mentors, people always want to help others, right? And, and I sought that out when I did so poorly. I went and found other friends of mine who have, who have been in corporate America. You know, take Francis as an example, right? He's been a, a great mentor to me. Um, in talking with Todd here and there, right? Uh, incredibly helpful. And, and I just think that as I think about a, a few things when it comes to transitioning, one is use your network, uh, ask for assistance, ask for help, be cognizant of how much time you're asking for, for certain. Uh, but there are people out there that are, that are, uh, passionate in, in, in doing and helping you out. The second is, like I talked about, the understanding why, what is your North Star? Um, why do you 
get out of bed every day. And the third is uh, knowing what your passions are. And, and I don't, I, I have, I have some now, but I think that they change, you know, today it's uh, mentorship, it's helping with entrepreneurship, it's helping with, other, helping with other entrepreneurs, but tomorrow may, it may be music or something different. So, and that goes back to lifelong learning, like uh, loving to learn. You know, uh, when we come out of the military, uh, our, our skills aren't necessarily always translatable, you know, not a whole lot of job openings for machine gunners in the private sector, uh, as an example. But I think the one thing that people miss is that you have all of these other disciplines and, and experiences that are relatable to what you're going to be doing and predictive of future success. Um, let's talk about your North Star again a little bit here. I love that analogy, I actually use it in our business all the time to talk about what our true north is. And um, what what's driving you? Uh, you know, you're the you're the chairman of the board of Sound Off now. Tell me, how does that fit mm -hmm. into your true north? What's going on there? So I'll, I'll go back to maybe take that question two, two ways. One is why volunteer? Why do I spend time with others? And I look at, I take stock of my life and I recognize, I'm gonna use a very unpopular term that's out there, but white privilege, right? I recognize I had a great grandfather who played uh, football at the University of Michigan, early 1900s. My grandfather went to that same university. My grandmother, my great uncle went to medical school there. It and education school. and yeah. it was a family school don't right. i don't know why i didn't apply but that's that's a whole other conversation um but just recognizing that i have been fortunate my entire life i have parents who are extremely involved in my life uh, they pushed me academically they they pushed me into uh, other other activities and i did, i wouldn't have known any better i'm just a you know idiot kid and and wanted to go do other things right and 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 waste time and so I look at my life in retrospect and I say, you know, I, I have been extremely blessed and fortunate and we're not in this life alone. We're in this life with others and others that may not be as fortunate or as lucky, or again, I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose my life or my family. I was put into this environment. I can't blame them now for my life because I'm an adult, but at the time I, and I just look back and I say, I need to continue to give back to others as much as I can. And it doesn't have to be go run a nonprofit. It doesn't mean you have to go um, do a missionary trip to uh, Guatemala. Uh, just every day I in, uh, talk about my North Star. It's, it's my, my belief in a God, my belief in uh, what the golden rule is, right? Doing others unto others as you want to do it to yourself, right? Being kind, being gracious, being loving. Uh, that is what motivates me every day. And it's sort of why I continue to be involved with Sound Off. But there's a more chilling story when it comes to my involvement with Sound Off. I don't know if you want to touch upon it, the organization for a little bit, maybe just as a Oh, yeah. what it Let's does and what there. we are i mean you know william negley was sure. uh, has been a guest on our program and we'll be publishing his uh his episode and you know he's got a very personal story you know around sound off so let's go there if you're willing. absolutely absolutely so so sound off is a mental health uh, app it's a smartphone app that enables veterans and service members to connect with licensed clinicians and trained vetted peer counselors completely anonymously. So you create a, a, a password, you're assigned a anonymous identification, username, and right away you can start texting or calling with a, uh, any one of those it, it, two. It's brilliant, uh, and it's, it's brilliant in its simplicity because as I shared with William, you know, I've got a family member that struggles with with the mental health issue and the stigma that is borne by the individual 
and the extended family as a result of that is <laughs> an impediment to seeking the help. Yes, and, and we we talk about the sort of the, the four barriers, right? Um, trust, I don't know this person, I don't know this doctor, I want to talk to somebody who's been there. Geography, the, the VA hospital is very far away, I, I can't, or I can't get to a clinic easily. Um, professional blowback or stigma, if I go seek mental health, uh, I'll seem maybe weak or more specifically, I'll lose my, my um, security clearance. Um, and uh, bureaucracy, it's too hard to get into a clinic to see somebody or, or, or talk with somebody. I just want to do it now on my time, on my terms. And yes, the simplicity of the model and the simplicity of the, of the approach is really, a, a, I'll say, a beautiful thing, but also created a very tough technological challenge. If you watch, uh, if you watch the, the program Social Dilemma on Netflix, oh. it's... Yeah, that was scary. Very scary, right? You know, former product managers from Silicon Valley or, or from, from well-known companies, still product managers, but they're coming out and saying, yeah, we, we are told we, we design these apps to monopolize your time, to keep you focused on our, on our platform so that you, you don't spend your time somewhere else on another application, another platform. And so data collection, uh, notifications, you know, these tugs that get you back into the use of the application are all part of the ecosystem. Well, it's, count, it's counter. What we've done with SoundOff is counter to that. We, while we want you to use the app, we expect a lot of these uh, relationships to transition off the platform and in person with the counselor they're talking comes to. the bridge to getting help. A bridge to getting help. Because what we're doing is we are focusing on the 47% of those who need support who don't seek it. Right. Um, that was a, a, a figure quoted by uh, a RAND, the RAND Institute. Right. And that's who who we're trying to speak to and, and, and support. Right. Hey, we get it. There's a, a few reasons why you don't seek help. But here is a simple, easy, no cost way for you to get mental health support. We, we've um, got to bring mental health out into the open, too, because, as I said, you know, I've got a I've got a son that struggles and, and, uh, it, it has been hard and the, the, uh, maybe the most, um, uh, freeing thing I ever did was kind of come out and say, you know what, we got to stop being embarrassed by the fact that we've got somebody in our, in our close family circle that's struggling with this because 10% of the families in America have something going on. And Absolutely. it's an enormous problem and, and, uh, you know, and it's a deadly illness, deadly. It absolutely is. And, uh, it, and, and we can't, we can't continue to treat it like, uh, you know, it's a joke. And, and I, I sit, you know, just as a, as a anecdotal example, having marital problems and we were going to a, a marriage counselor and I was waiting uh, for my, my ex to, to show up and I was just standing outside of the, the, the door. It was locked and I felt embarrassed. I, you know, everybody has uh, challenges with, with life. And I, I, for whatever reason, I was just embarrassed just standing there. No, somebody walking up and seeing me waiting outside of a, of right. a clinic to go see help. And it's, it, it shouldn't be that way. It absolutely shouldn't be that way. So, so sound off, uh, what, what are some of the uh, strategic initiatives and objectives for sound off from the chairman of the board perspective on this? You got William Negley, who's, who's out there running this thing full time. Uh, what, sure. uh, you know, what, what sort of the, the next year look like, you know, uh, you got a huge problem. Yeah, let me you got, you, and you guys are sort of a network of networks too. You're bringing your collaboration uh, effort, you know, uh, is, is significant. Absolutely. Let me let me take a step back. Um, I didn't get to finish the story with with how I got involved with Sound Off. So early in my in my startup days, I was um, we had partnered with Chris Kyle's company, um, Craft International out of Dallas. Uh, Chris being the you know the the uh, Navy SEAL from American Sniper, and we were working on border security. And during that time, 
specifically the border between Texas and, and Mexico. And during that time, I met a, a gentleman by the name of Bill Mulder, who was uh, taking some time off active service, doing recruiting work down in San Antonio, uh, as a SEAL Team 6 operator, just a really great guy. And fast forward a few years after working with Bill, I'm in business school and I meet William Negley. And it turns out that William's brother-in-law is Bill. So William's mm -hmm. sister married to, to Bill. Mm -hmm. And William and I were in an entrepreneurship class together, Rob Adams class. And we were taking, because William had already founded Sound Off and um, had the idea and was, was working on the technology. So we had taken this idea of anonymous mental health support and had pitched it as an idea for um, a different market for professional athletes. And this kind of talks into the strategy longer term. But as we were walking onto the stage, literally William got the call from his family saying that yeah. Bill had just committed, committed suicide. And it just was this galvanizing moment for all of us i said boy you know i'm, I'm here i want to get involved what can what, i mean it was just there's a reason why it happened at that and moment the, at that the, time. the timing of that is so incredible i can't even imagine no it was chilling and and i said yes this is this is a calling i mean god has little little uh, signs throughout our days but that I'm not was sure a, that wasn't a big clap you know symbols yeah, it, it, right it, it, in right in your face that this was something you needed to be doing absolutely and and to your question about near-term long-term strategy we're continuing to your point growing the awareness and growing the use of the platform uh we, we could spend a lot of money advertising and, and telling veterans telling clinicians and telling other veterans to sign up as battle buddies to get on the platform and, and, and we'll continue to have that that budget and, and fundraise to 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 bring awareness but we found leveraging partnerships through other in the near term veteran service or benevolent organizations like special forces travel trust like the navy seal foundation like task force dagger um like the uh nice soccer foundation right we continue to grow awareness and grow the use of the application that way um and i think that same model can be leveraged using not just special operations focused groups but also veteran service organizations more holistically and also um corporate america we had a, a conversation with pepsico right in each company a lot of fortune 500 companies have uh, employee resource groups or diverse business groups, right? One of one of which is for for veterans. USA has one. VetNet is called, and that's a great way for us to bring awareness. Just having a conversation with that that group and saying, "Hey, if you if you want to seek help, join the platform. If you want to provide help, or both, come sign up and 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 join join the team." So that's that's. And it's, go ahead, Bob. No, we, you know, we're, we're running up against our, our time limit here. You know, one of the things uh, William and I got into is, is the uh, amplifying effect that COVID is having on mental health issues. So you, you know, uh, we, we sort of coined the, or used the term in the, in our conversation, we're sort of in the perfect storm. You know, you, you've got somebody who's got PTSD issues, uh, they've lost a job, you know, there's isolation, mm -hmm. uh, they're just all of the these things that are contributing to the mental health issue and making it that much more acute of a problem right now. Absolutely. And, and I, these, these two stories I'm going to tell are not veterans, but, and, and again, there is, there isn't data uh, nationally to talk about how prevalent of a problem it is with the exception of, of, you know, uh, increase of, of suicides for the veteran population. But more broadly for the US population, uh, a cousin of a friend of mine, she lost her job and hung, ended up hang, hanging herself. And, and it was just tragic. And another friend, uh, he lost his job and, and got back into drugs and, and is now back uh, and trying to fight the addiction. And so absolutely, I think this is the, a, in, in a bad way, a perfect storm of people need some help. And, and 
let me just say that post-traumatic stress isn't a uniquely veteran problem. I think it's often spoken in, in veteran circles, but as I think about more broadly, other populations that could benefit from this sort of approach, this model, this technology, any, any group where it's stigmatized to seek mental health. I read in the Wall Street Journal that the construction industry struggles with this, right? <laughs> Professional athletes, uh, teens. I think, you know, I'm, I'm talking to my stepdaughter and, and she thinks this would be a great, you know, a great approach to use for, for young teens because everyone thinks young adults don't have problems. What do you know? You haven't lived your life, but it continues to, to uh, pers persist, you know? We, we've got to make an, an introduction. So David Gallagher, who is not a veteran, but uh, had a daughter with uh, mental health issues and now has the Cameron Gallagher Foundation. Uh, they uh, do Speak Up 5 K is sort of their events that they host to, uh, you know, raise funds for awareness for for exactly what you're talking about. You and David need to connect because because your idea of sort of taking the military call sign vernacular, a color, an animal, a number, you know, and 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 creating that anonymous connection is. Uh, something that we've got to spread across many outlets. James, we're, we're running up against, uh, you know, t I, I, I do these talks and, and, uh, and these conversations and the time flies by. And, and once again, here <laughs> I'm having to ask my guests to be quiet. Thank you so much for stepping into the spotlight. Really appreciate that. Uh, thanks for having me on, Bob. I really enjoyed the conversation and, uh, uh, I hope everyone has a very safe and healthy and happy holiday. Thank you. We're going to put uh, uh, ways to get in touch with James and uh, sound off in the show notes and uh, uh, just uh, make sure that you can reach out. We're going to raise awareness. Let's go make some connections. You know, I think we discovered in the conversation here of all these people, we know this, this tangled web of, of connections, but it's time to put that to work. So we've been listening to James Patrick. He is a risk products executive with SWBC and importantly, the chairman of the board of SoundOff. Thank you so much for stepping into the spotlight today. The spotlight airs on Tuesday. Tuesdays and Fridays, and we try to bring individuals, veterans, and military spouses who are making an impact in our community. Thanks so much, James, for being on the program. Bravo Zulu to you, and that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Spotlight by Veteran Crowd. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and uploads, please visit our website at veterancrowdnetwork.com. We'll see you next time.